Hey, it's Brandon. This episode is sponsored by Swanson Health. Swanson Health is the only company to offer the full spectrum of wellness products for mind, body, and home. From quality vitamins and supplements to cruelty-free beauty items to eco-friendly home products, Swanson Health is here to keep you healthy. Swanson Health only supports products they're proud to use and give to their own families, backing everything by strict quality standards with the Swanson Quality Code. Swanson Health carries over 20,000 wellness products at a great value. And in fact, I got a chance to use several of the products from ones that I've already used like Burt's Bees hand cream to new ones like the probiotics by Swanson Health. And I was so happy to use those products and they're, and they're great. So pick up all of your favorite health products, plus discover new ones for your wellness routine, all while leaving money in your pocket. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code WORK20 for 20% off on Swanson.com. That's code WORK20 for 20% off on Swanson.com. Now on to the show. Hey, welcome to Transform Your Workplace. I am Brandon Laws, your host. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to put a quick plug in. We did a webinar at Zenium last week on anti-racism and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we basically, we had four panelists, uh, Portland, Oregon-based business leaders and who are doing a ton of work in this, this space and are... Uh, very vocal in the community and are just, they're so smart when it comes to this. And uh, admittedly, I'm starting my whole journey on, on just learning more about uh, racism and, and all of it. So um, I really appreciated this webinar and I think you guys will enjoy it too. It's free. The replay is free on our website. We have, we had like 250 people sign up and show up for the webinar live, but the recordings for free and you just go to the zeniumhr.com content center and you'll see the webinar replays and you can, I mean, you can go back and watch all of them, but this one's for free. It's at the very top of the page. Just click the link and start watching it. It's uh, embedded on, on YouTube uh, as a video. So enjoy that. So today's episode, I had a conversation with Allah Hunkins. He is the author of Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. I really enjoyed this conversation with Allah. If you are a human resource person, a professional who is supporting your teams with you know, developing leadership skills and you know helping managers kind of level up, this book is great for that. There's uh, kind of the blueprint as far as how to become a better leader. And if you're a leader, you're an existing leader who just really wants to build their self-awareness and just get some more tools to becoming a better leader, this is a fantastic book. I loved it. Um, a lot was great. And he has. There's what I love about it mostly is that there's so many good stories in this that show examples of what it means to be a great leader. So I think you're going to like that a lot. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn or Instagram or anywhere uh, that you're on social media. I uh, I love hearing from you guys. And, and also if you're liking the podcast and you know, any suggestions or feedback is, is absolutely welcome. So always appreciate hearing from you guys and enjoy today's episode. I'll talk to you next week. <music> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's good to have you. Oh, Brandon, it is such a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much. I'm happy to talk about your book, Cracking the Leadership Code. Let's talk about why you wrote the book in the first place. And you open up the introduction with a funny story. I mean, it's actually really sad, but you talk about the U.S. Postal Service and one other, I'm putting air quotes, strategic decisions to make customers happier regarding wait times. What did they do to try and change that? Yeah, this is one of those, you read these stories and you scratch your head like, what were they thinking? So yeah, the U.S. Postal Service, they had done all this customer analysis and that they found that customers were really upset that they were having to wait in line so long. So yeah, they put together literally an 87-page strategic manual and they decided the best thing they could come up with was 
while people are waiting in line too long, let's take the clocks out of the lobbies of the post office. It's comical. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's like, it's so comical and you scratch your head. So to me, it was just a great example of, you know, you could say it's the execution, it's the strategy. It boils down to it's the leadership. It's the people. Why do you do what they do? So that's where it all started yeah, so from. They didn't obviously crack the leadership code. So you probably wrote this book thinking like, okay, there's leaders out here like this that are making decisions that are so on the surface insane. But obviously when they're in a room building their plan, they didn't think it was insane. Yeah, exactly. They don't think about that at all. And so for me, the genesis of this all, because I've been working with leaders in the corporate world for almost 25 years. So I've gotten to work with thousands of groups. And the thing is, you know, over time, you start to see patterns, patterns of behavior. So I noticed, you know, here are some great teams and great leaders. And these great leaders are, have patterns of what they're doing in common. That's good. And then you look at teams and leaders that are mediocre and you see patterns there too. It's like, what are they doing? That's really mediocre. And so I started taking notes. I'd hear stories. I'd do interviews and, and work with people. And I would take these notes. And then I started writing. The notes turned into blog posts. And ultimately, the blog posts turned into chapters. And then the chapters turned into this book. Because what I realized was, you know, I've gotten all these years of firsthand fly-on-the-wall experience in working with people. People shouldn't have to suffer through 20 years of bad leadership to learn a thing or two. So the book is really a distillation of all of that knowledge, but in a really practical level so that people can take it and then start to accelerate their leadership growth and, and shorten their learning curve. You wrote that too many leaders don't understand what it takes for them to succeed. They mean well and work hard, but they lack the proper mindset and tools. Why do you think that is? Well, it really boils down to, you know, before we get into the question of tools, it really is that question of mindset. I think that too many leaders end up in their jobs because, frankly, they were good at the task. For example, you're a really good salesperson. Let's make you the sales leader or the sales manager. And so people go into these roles really not having been trained to be a leader of people. They've been trained at the function or the task, but those are totally different skill sets. And so I think a lot of leaders don't recognize that you have signed up for a very different job. You can't just rely on the things that got you to where you are. If you try to do what you did, you're not going to succeed. And I think in some ways that is the first hurdle. The next big hurdle is, okay, they realize, well, I'm a leader now. I have to come up with something and role model this. And they come up with basically the role models they've known, which is whatever they grew up with. And it's amazing. And I write about this in the book and this whole section about context. I write about the fact that most leaders have inherited a leadership legacy or a playbook, if you will, that really dates back to the early 20th century, and it was designed for the industrial age. And that playbook only worked well in a factory where 95% of people were doing repetitive tasks on a factory line, assembly line, over and over again. It doesn't work in the knowledge economy that we're living in today. So those are a couple of the big issues that leaders face as they step into these roles. Yeah, and I think as a lot of people step into those roles, they might have an aha moment and say, wow, I need a change to be a better leader. And some people don't have that aha moment, but you describe a district manager named Matt. I think he was in like the food industry, but he had been with the company for 23 years, always ranked in the bottom half of the district managers out of like 100 people. But at some point, he changed and he flipped it and he became number one. What was his answer when asked about how he made that change to be a better leader? Yeah, when I met Matt, yeah, Matt does work in a retail industry. And so he was the number one out of 100 district managers. There's 100 districts, and he was the number one ranked one. I, when I met him, I said, so have you always been number one? And he laughed at me. He said, ha, ha, <laughs> When I started, I was like 84. For years, I was like 84, oh. 83. It's not well. So I asked him exactly that. I said, what changed, Matt? And he said, it's amazing. He said, when I started, I thought my job was to be the fixer. Like, you know, because in their industry, they would get these daily, they call them the hot list. It was key performance indicators. So he could see in all the stores he had to go to what was working well, what wasn't. And so he would look at the things that were marked in red and like, I got to fix this. So I, he'd run off from store to store. He'd hop in his car. He'd drive around his whole district and he'd run in and he'd say, okay, this isn't working. You need to fix this. And he would tell people what to do. And it didn't work very well. All he thought was in terms of tasks and in terms of problems. What Matt failed to realize, what he realized later, was that he was dealing with people. Like ultimately, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're in the people business first. 
And so what Matt described to me, so when I started to shift, it was when I realized people don't want a fixer. They actually want a leader. I said, so what does that look like, Matt? He said, well, for the first thing, they want to know that you care about them. So I realized that when I come in, instead of going into task mode, that I should take a minute or two and say, hey, how was your weekend, Brandon? <laughs> you know, and just like find out something personal about them or what's going on and to build some relationship. And then instead of coming in and saying, you know, we've got this problem here that you got to fix going, hey, this is the issue. What do you think we should do? And instead of turning it into this tell, push monologue, he should actually try to pull and create a dialogue. So really having some conversation and communication. And guess what? What he found is people started to step up and create their own solutions. And what was amazing for Matt, he said, you know, I'm number one. I've been number one top district manager for a few years now. I work so much less hard than I did when I was 84. And the funny thing about it is I have so much more fun too. And to top it off, a number of his former managers are now also district managers. So it's a great story of just the power of understanding what leadership isn't, like the fixer, and what it really is, which is about how do you serve the people that you lead? Let's talk about you a little bit. So I think it was 1999, you were running for an executive director position, I believe. It was. It was at a nonprofit. Exactly and your one competitor was Gary. And I think you thought you were going to win. You were going to win this it was a board vote or something like that, but it, you lost in, a, in pretty much a landslide. What did, in the conversation with Gary, like a month following that election, what did you find out from Gary about what it meant to be a successful leader? Because you talk about influence over authority and why that might have been a big factor in this case. Yeah, yeah. It's a good. I'll never forget this moment in my life. It was my epic failure. So Gary, yeah. So I had been working with this not-for-profit for three years. And in my mind, I was a shoe in for this job. And we had this election where you basically an annual meeting where anyone could come and show up. And so we had this election and Gary's only been there six months. No one knows who he is, you know? And so of course we had the election and yes, I get creamed. I think I lost on like 38 votes to six. I mean, I couldn't believe it, it was just horrible. Like, and so I met with Gary a month later and sort of somewhat jokingly offhandedly, I said, well, Gary, did you expect to get all those votes? Kind of thinking, you know, he'd kind of blow it off. And he said, oh, of course I did, dead serious. And I said, well, how? He said, well, I reached out to people. I got to know them one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. mm -hmm. I, I actually went out for lunch or for coffee and asked them about themselves and got to know them. Then I asked them why they were involved in our organization and what they would do if they were in charge, what they would change, what they like, what they keep. And then based on that, I shared with them my vision for why I was running. And then I had told them I had this vision that it would be a whole team of people working together. And I asked them to show up on election day and vote for me. So Gary tells me all this story. And I'm sure you've had this experience where someone tells you something and you can feel your brain exploding in this blinding <laughs> flash of the obvious. Because everything that Gary said to me in this moment, Brendan, made complete sense. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, like, Absolutely. I mean, ask people to show up and vote. What a good idea. Because what I didn't realize at the time, and I've had a number of mentors have told me this since, is that I was suffering from this myth that good work should speak for itself. Is that if I believe it too, because it's intuitive. Yeah. But and we're it's not what day, right? like in people. school, if you do good work, and I was a good student, I was a good little student at school. I'd get A's and like, you know, and I'd progress and the teachers were, but you know what? Life isn't school and you've got to draw outside the lines. And so for me thinking that somehow my work that I knew was good and it was good, but that's not all. That's not what leadership is about. Leadership is about a relationship between people. And Gary understood that. He had his own business. I didn't know any of that stuff. So that was a huge lesson. And what Gary modeled in that wonderful or terrible, depending on who you were, in that experience was he modeled what I have now come to know as what I call the three secrets of building strong leaders, which is connection, right? He reached out to people, made a personal connection. And then communication is the second, right? Really having a dialogue with people. And then collaboration which is working together. So connection, communication, and collaboration. It's the subtitle of the book, The Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. And then we dive into depth with that further. What is the best way to help leaders really take a look in the mirror and gain self-awareness so that they can grow in those three areas that you talked about? Because, I mean, without that moment where Gary told you about what he was doing and you had that like explosion in your brain happen... Without that moment, I don't know if you ever would have changed, maybe down the road, but at least it happened earlier in your career. So how do we find moments like that to have self-awareness and look at ourselves? 
Brent, that is an amazingly good question. And I think such an important one because it's so easy for us to continue doing the same old, same old. And I think it was what Albert Einstein was the one who said, you know, if you do what you always did, you'll get what you always got or something about that. The, the reason for insanity is that, right? So I think ultimately there's a couple things when it comes to developing the self-awareness. There's the self-awareness of you reflecting on your own behavior. And part of that is your willingness to press pause every so often. And actually, whether it's journaling, but every day we get presented with experiences and to go, how did I do? Am I willing to really take an honest inventory of what went well and what would I do differently? And some of us are better geared at that than others. The fact is to look in the mirror means you have to be willing to put your ego aside because the tendency is to want to go, gosh, I'm beautiful. I'm amazing. I'm perfect. I don't do anything wrong, right? <laughs> And so we have to get past that. So that's one thing for the self-awareness. And the other big piece, and this is the thing that probably has helped me the most in my own personal and leadership development, is finding people who will give me honest feedback about how I show up in my behavior. Because let me tell you, Brandon, when you have nine people and they all say, you know, Alain, you come across as a bit arrogant and aloof. And when you're under stress, you get really tense and you steamroll over people. When the ninth person has said that to you in the course of a couple of years, it's time to go, hmm, nine against one. I wonder who's right here, you know? And so for me, getting feedback, I'm giving you like the blunt, they were maybe a little bit more politically correct than that, but they were pretty direct about it. So it's finding people who are not going to, you know, give you what you want to hear. And this is what I think a lot of CEOs, you hear about CEO disease, right? Because people never give them the truth. They only give them what's working well. So to get some feedback from people who are going to really tell you what they see honestly, because feedback is great. I like to think of feedback. It's like, you know, the rumble strips on the highway. They're not yeah. mean, they're not bad, they're not good, they're just feedback. And you have a choice. You go on the rumble strip, you wake up, get back on the road, or you could you know, turn off the snooze alarm and then just like run off the road. So feedback are like rumble strips. And the goal is to keep you on course to get to your destination more quickly and safer. And I think it's a really good analogy for what feedback ought to be about. And unfortunately, so few people have had that experience. But so for me, it's that self-awareness and the feedback are the key things to developing your own growth. How does poor leadership happen or like, how do we develop poor leaders? Is it intentional by them? Does it just sort of organically happen? Is it bad influences? Or I'm just curious if there's a common thread that you've found amongst poor leaders. Yeah, I'd say there is a common thread. And the common thread within poor leadership boils down to they put the leader first, that the world sort of is like they are the center mm, of the yeah. universe. And actually, I'll use an analogy, actually, which is around parenting, which is in some ways a lot that's a different, right? So my son just turned 16 last week and he's my, my oldest. I have a 13 year old driving. Boy. Well, yeah, I know. It's pretty scary. Think about that. Speaking of rumble strips. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, but I remember when my son was born and I remember holding him and I think a lot of new parents might experience this, but you know, before he was born, I was sort of the center of the universe in my world. You know, it was like, it was pretty much focused on me. And I very early on remember thinking, God, it's not about me. It never was about me. That was just a myth. And that, you know, I'm in a much larger interdependent whole. And the fact is, when the kid, when your baby wakes up at three in the morning, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's like they need attending to and you go and attend. That's your job. Your job is to serve. And I think too many people end up in roles of leadership, formal leadership, which comes along with a certain level of status, maybe a pay raise, some power and some authority. And frankly, we get a little drunk on it. We get a little drunk by the power and suddenly we can go into the default of do this because I'm the leader. That's why. Or I'm the daddy. That's why. Right. So easy to default because it's frankly, we can be lazier. We can just phone it in instead of taking the time. So there's this whole, the pattern behind poor leadership boils down to, I think it's my job to tell people what to do. And again, that is a holdover from the industrial age and it's trying to lead using power. And at best, at only best, when you're leading with power, will you get people to comply, but you will never get their commitment. You will never get their engagement. And so if you think about it, compliance may have worked on the assembly line where it was a fixed job, yeah. but today, what does compliance look like? You know, you want people thinking and dealing with complex problems and- Especially in the knowledge, yeah, the knowledge worker, we need exactly. people. We're knowledge worker, exactly. So it's all about how do you see connections and create new solutions and have ideas that didn't exist and create new innovative ways to help our customers solve their problems. You know, because without that, you're stuck. And so back in the day, 
when people were in the factory, we didn't have the same access to information. The fact is, as employees, our expectations of what we expect from work and our leaders has gone through the roof. And the fact is, today, between LinkedIn and Glassdoor, people know where the grass is greener, and no one's afraid to hop the fence because there's no lifetime employment in 20 years, you get a gold watch. That's gone. You know, there's no pensions. So now it's a question of what is the value proposition for you as a leader? What are you going to do to keep me in place? Because frankly, if I can get paid 15% more to have the same kind of mediocre relationship with another employer, I'll jump ship in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. All on that note, do you think it's a good idea for people, especially leaders who want to grow and learn and be the best leader they possibly could be, to study the history of management and leadership? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I write a lot about this. So I think it's important to understand, not that you have to know, like, you don't have to become a PhD scholar, but to understand where you come from, certainly, because you can't change what you don't notice. And if you want to move forward, it's probably a good idea to know where you come from. And if we look at the whole field of organizational management and leadership, it dates back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the father of scientific management was a guy named Frederick Winslow Taylor. And he was mm -hmm. by training a mechanical engineer. And he was brought into factories to figure out how, and these factories were basically moving what they called pig iron, which were basically iron rods, which they used to use to build the railroads. How can we move haul pig iron, more pig iron? And it was literally, they, it was backbreaking work. These, these things weighed about 40 pounds and have to load up freight cars. And like, how can we get the least number of workers to load the maximum amount of pig iron on a freight car as possible? I mean, that was the sort of ex, the thought experiments that he'd started with. And in his mind, he had a couple of very strong beliefs. Taylor believed that every single employee was basically going to work as slowly as possible and to convince their employer that they were working at a good pace. And he writes about this in his book, Principles of Scientific Management. So basically, he first of all believes that people are just lazy by nature and are gonna to try to take advantage of the system. The second thing he believes, and he writes this, he compares the ideal workman, at the time, of course, it wasn't women, it was just men. The ideal workman, and I'm gonna quote him for a second here, should be so phlegmatic is that they should resemble an ox more than anything else. Wow. Like you read that. Like, that creates a very, very much of us versus them sort of mentality though. I think that, oh, it's completely because the whole idea was management were the brains and workers were the brawn. Again, this is manual labor for the most part. And so that became the imprimatur for how people were led. And if that wasn't scary enough, and that by the way is direct quote from Principles of Scientific Management. When Harvard Business School was founded, their curriculum was based on, surprise, surprise, Taylor's Principles of Scientific Management. And that was voted the most influential business book of the 20th century. So that Unreal. set the tone for how organizations have seen labor in terms of managers, employees, leaders, followers. That set the tone for a very, very, very long time. And, you know, if you don't stop and think about where you come from, I don't know if you have this experience, Brandon. I know you've got small kids, but I have found this experience where I remember saying to my kids once, I literally said to them, will you turn off those lights? Who do you think works here? Con Edison, right? Which is like, that is something my mom used to say to me. And the words came out of my mouth. And I went, holy crap. I cannot believe I just said exactly what was said to me. And I think we got to check those inherited legacies at the door. And that's why I think it's so important to be aware of where we come from. How is access to information nowadays cause leaders to grow and push them to lead differently? Because I think you really talked about how transparency is really the new normal for leaders in every industry. I'm sure a lot of them aren't doing it, but why might the access that people have change the way people are leading? Yeah, it's a big deal, right? If we think about access to information. So back in the old day, there was what we would call information asymmetry. The easiest example is if you think back you know, 30 years ago, if you wanted to buy a car, you'd have to go up to a, like a used car. You go to the lot and they would tell you about the car and you get information about the price. And then if you wanted to compare, you have to go to another place and you have to find out that and you, you weren't sure. Are they telling you the truth or not? You don't know. Well, now, you know, we've got all these websites like autotrader.com. Suddenly everyone has access to the same information. But we now have moved from a world of information asymmetry to a level playing field or information symmetry. So whereas before leaders had, they were the repository of knowledge and they were kind of the keepers of the storehouse, right? They kept the keys to the kingdom. 
and they would dole out little parcels of information. Here, you need to know this. Here, you need to know this. Well, now everyone has access to the same information. Yeah. And so the role of the leader is much less about this commander and controller and doler out of information. And it's more to facilitate the movement of where information is to where it needs to be. Because no one needs more information. We're all drowning in information. What we need is we need insight and understanding. Because once we get understanding, then we can make the best decisions to create the best possible results. So that's where that comes from. You had a quote that illustrated that point really well. The quote says, in this flatter, faster world, there's no way one person can corner the market on knowledge. You're dependent on the eyes and ears of your people and their willingness to share what they see and hear, end quote. How does that fact shape the leader of the future? Gosh, what it means is that the leader of the future has to be able to build the relationship so that the person who is that eyes and ears on the front line is not just able to see, but is also willing to share what they see as well as their judgments and their knowledge about what they think that means so that we basically are creating this aggregate, like mastermind, as it were, of people so that we can make great decisions. And that that person not only feels that, but is also empowered to be able to turn around and have the autonomy to act in a moment. I'll just give you an example. You look at for example, within the field of auto insurance, it used to be if you were in a car accident, you know, it would take weeks to get a claim adjuster figured out and get a check paid out. Now you look at companies like Progressive Auto, they are now empowered with the information they have. They show up on site, they have their portable laptops, and they can issue a check on the spot, right? And so suddenly you look at, of course, if I know that one auto company can issue me a claim check instantly and somebody else is going to be two or three weeks and the premiums are the same price, which one would I go and work with? Right. So it's kind of a no brainer is realizing that, you know, whatever we can do to remove the friction, you know, I mean, this is what Amazon obviously does so well, right? They remove the friction from purchases, one click ordering, like everyone wants the world to be a one click everything now. And so I think as a leader, we have to facilitate the movement of knowledge so that we can simplify our processes, our products, our services, so that people have a more frictionless experience and they feel that they're more connected, whether that's through the social purpose, our environmental footprint. I mean, there's so many different things that we can be doing both with our employees as well as with our customers that make that difference. And so having those eyes and ears and being connected to those eyes and ears is where it all starts. You talk about connection as being one of those humongous main pillars to being a great leader of the future. and I'm curious what your Trader Joe's experience taught you about empathy, because empathy is huge when it comes to connection. Empathy is the heart of connection, because if you think about, first of all, I'll define empathy for all the listeners. My simple definition is empathy is showing people that you understand them and care how they feel. And on the surface, that seems so human and basic, and it is, but sometimes it's not always so easy. So yeah, so the story on Trader Joe's is, so I live in Western Massachusetts, and there's a Trader Joe's that's about 40 minute drive from my house. I'm not that close by, so I wouldn't go that often. And I was doing this whole day of errands where I was picking up, my daughter was with me. We went, picked up some dry cleaning, went to the library, picked up my son who was in preschool at the time. And then we swung around and we ended up at Trader Joe's. And we get there, I get out of the car and I realize, oh my gosh, I've left my wallet somewhere. I don't have it. I must've lost it <laughs> or something. And I'm replaying the day and I realized, no, I didn't lose it. I just knowing me, which makes sense. I left it at home. So I called my wife on my cell phone and yes, I had left my wallet at home. But now I've got this problem because I'm in the Trader Joe's parking lot and I'm with my kids and I have this whole shopping list and I'm 40 minutes from home and I really don't want to go home. I want to do this. So I think, great. So what can I do? So I try to put the brain in high gear and I figure out, well, let me ask these guys a question because I travel all the time for work and I had actually memorized my entire 16 digit credit card as long with the secret four digit code or whatever it was, right? Because I've been giving it so often. So I thought, let me ask them inside if I can use the credit card, if they can call in the number to process the transaction. Who knows? It's it's crazy idea. Maybe it'll work. So I put my kids into the shopping cart and I push them up to the front and we go to the manager's booth and there's a woman up there. Her name's Carlotta. I remember her name. And uh, Carlotta said, I explained the whole situation to her. And as I'm finishing up with her, and she says, I'm sorry, you know, after I explain the whole situation, I'm sorry, but we need to have the physical credit card for you to shop here. I'm just sorry. That's just the way things work. And so at this point, I'm completely dejected and I'm ready to take my tail and tuck it between my legs and <laughs> put my shopping cart out with my kids and get yep. back to the minivan, go back home. 
And then all of a sudden this guy, and I didn't even recognize he was just standing behind Carlotta the whole time. He says, Hey, you live in Northampton. Is that right? I said, yeah. He said, yes, that's a long way with the construction that's on the bridge right now. He said, I'm Peter, the assistant manager here. You left your wallet at home. Is that right? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and shop? And when you're done, just call me over and I'll put it on my card. I'm sorry. What? Like, I really didn't understand what he's saying. You have a, some kind of company store card you can do that on? He said, he said, no, no, I, I'll just go ahead and put it on my own personal credit card. And then next time you come in the store, you can just pay me back. <laughs> I love that. I said, you would do that? He said, what, should I not? Should I not trust you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I just like, that's amazing. He said, it happens more often than you think. Really, it's no big deal. I said, I'm leaving town tomorrow on a business trip. I won't be back for a week. He said, oh, it's no problem. Just come back, pay me back when you're ready. Well... You know, I go shopping and $73.66 later, I, Peter swipes his card and I'm on my way. And as you can imagine, I get home. The first thing I do is tell my wife. And I said, look, I got to write a check right now. Can you please go over the river tomorrow and go pay Peter? As much <laughs> back? You know, and of course, not only do we pay him back, but I have told this story to so many people. I suddenly went from a kind of casual Trader Joe's shopper to a raving fan, right? Obviously. And like, I feel like their family, like I see Peter is like, hey. You know, these are people who watched out for me. Now, people have sometimes heard the story from me and they said, what are you saying? I have to, you know, basically trust people and give them money. I think that's not the point. The point is, what can you do through empathy? Because that's what Peter was showing. He was showing, he understood me and he cared how I feel. He really got my experience and he looked for ways to help deal with my issue. But he started by this place of empathy, of connection, of caring. And so I think for all of us as leaders is realizing, can we take that time and connect on that very basic, primal human level with people so that then we can help them? And when you do that, you have a quote unquote customer for life. I'm so glad you told that story. When I read it, I was like, no wonder you had like an aha moment as far as like connecting with people and showing empathy. And the fact that you're telling that story over and over again, it's like the experience alone is just life altering. It can rally people like you telling that story. Now people probably think of Trader Joe's differently now. I do. Oh, yeah, for no, sure. For sure. For sure. And it's funny because I've had other people have come up and told me their quote unquote Trader Joe's story because Apparently, one of the things that Trader Joe's in the whole philosophy is about what can you do to offer exceptional, outstanding customer service? And, you know, it's not a playbook for that. It's funny, you know, Nordstrom's, which is also, by the way, known for their exceptional customer interactions, they have a handbook and the handbook has one rule. It says, use good judgment in the face mm -hmm. of all situations. That's it, right? Use good judgment. And so what's interesting to me is, like you said, Brandon, like that was one day, that was one interaction in Peter's life, and yet it stuck with me. And to me, it's a testament to the power of connected human empathetic leadership that when we take the time, we get remembered, you know, and I think, you know, what kind of memory or what kind of legacy do we want to leave? Yes, it's a little of extra effort in the moment, but just think about the dividends that that pays both personally and professionally. Let's switch over to communication to talk about that pillar real quick. So why is being an effective communicator like so much harder? It seems like it really should be. It seems like it should be easy. But I don't know. Well, yes, nowadays, yeah. because we have so many ways to communicate, it seems like it should be easier. But leaders struggle with this all the time. What's the wrong way to do it? And what's the right way to do it? Sure. Well, one of the reasons I think that we struggle with it so much is I think in a lot of ways, we take it for granted. The fact is, look, if all your parts are in working order, that is, you have eyes that see and ears that hear and a mouth can talk and fingers that can type. You think, oh, I'm communicating, I'm hearing, I'm listening, but that's not really what it's about. So we take it for granted. It's kind of like the power or the internet connection. You know, my son, 16 year old Alex, he is a gamer. And so when there is a blip in the internet, oh my gosh, you hear the howls of the, <laughs> of the dreaded lag, right? And so yep. like, it's all fine until it's not, right? The power is all good until it's out. And with communication, it's the same way. We take for granted, we assume that good communication is happening until it doesn't. And unfortunately, it doesn't a lot of the time. And there's a few reasons why. I mean, one reason is to get alignment between what people say and what they mean and what we hear is really tough because oftentimes what people say isn't exactly what they mean. And then what we hear isn't exactly either of those two things. So a lot gets in the way. And what we have to realize that as leaders, we are never communicating just for communication's sake. That in fact, the goal of our communication should always be to create mutual shared understanding. That what you see is what I see, 
And what you mean is what I mean. And what you hear is what I hear. Because it's so important to have shared understanding because shared understanding becomes the platform on which we make all of our future decisions. So if we have great understanding, we can make the best decisions to get great results. If we have poor misunderstanding, we're going to take lousy decisions and we're going to get lousy results. And so having that kind of framework should raise the stakes, realizing that every time I go into a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a group meeting is that we want to step back and realize how can I make sure everyone here is walking away with 100% accurate understanding. And so there should be this level of kind of communication police, right? This vigilance. So what are you doing to check in to make sure that happens? In the section about collaboration, I think it was early on in the chapter, you sort of joked, I think along with a US bank executive about like imposing your will in order to get people to collaborate with each other. And it was like a list of like how people should act and behave. And it was, it was really in jest because today's leader really can't do that. Like as we talked about earlier, people are thinking, they're knowledge workers, they're smart, right? And they show up to work differently. And sometimes they know more than the leaders. So how do we as leaders get people to, how do we influence them to collaborate and work together? Because that's a huge component to leadership. Oh, it is a huge component. And so if we think about, yeah, we can't mandate, right? Yeah, that email story was like effective immediately. You will speak up, do the right thing, ask <laughs> yeah. it sincerely, your CEO, blank. Like, you know, if someone could write that email and click send and it would work, they would have done it a long time ago. Clearly, that's not what's going to make people collaborate. So what I found in my research is it turns out that in order for people to collaborate, what you as a leader need to do is create the optimal environment for collaboration to happen, right? So you can't do it directly, but what you can do is you can design this environment. So I like to call these collaborative or motivational choice architects. And whereas traditional architects work with line and structure to create buildings, what we're trying to do as leaders is create great optimal environments. And so to do that, we're actually working with human needs, is that all of our human needs need to be met at a certain level. And I boil them down to four basic workplace needs. So we all have a need for safety. So first of all, there's physical safety. Obviously, why people are sheltering in place is because physical safety is compromised. So physical safety, financial safety. So are you getting paid a wage that you can afford to do with this work? And then there's psychological safety, that people feel that they can speak up without repercussions, that they can contribute and be part of the team. So there's safety. Another need that we have is energy, is that people need to feel that the environment they're in energizes them, right? We've all been in those meetings that we come away, we're energized, and then there are ones that we walk away, we feel like zombies. So what are you doing to create more energy in the environment for people and less? We all have a need for purpose, the sense that what we do matters, that there's meaning, that it's bigger than just ourselves. So there are things that leaders can do that people can feel that what they're doing has a stronger purpose. And then there's also the need for ownership, that people don't like micromanaging. And what they do want is to be as much as possible to have autonomy and self-direction, because all the research shows that when people are making progress towards a meaningful goal, it's actually the number one driver of motivation. So again, to recap, you've got safety, energy, purpose, and ownership. And so what we can do as leaders is design an environment where we can have those needs be met. And I'll just give you a couple of simple, practical, tactical things that you can do to meet a couple of those needs. And I go through tons of these throughout the book. But for example, in the need for energy, I'm sure you've had this experience, Brendan, but have you been to the two or three hour meeting that never took a break? Uh, yep, and yep. I hate those. Of course you do, everyone does, because biologically you're wired to really go no more than 90 minutes of mental focus at any one thing. So a simple tool is, I call it, use the 90 minute rule schedule in in advance that we're going to take a break every 90 minutes or more frequently. So a simple thing to do to make sure that people's energy doesn't lag. Really, really simple thing, right? Another simple thing around energy is what I call direct less and facilitate more. Frank is no one wants to be spoken at and talked at and lectured to for minutes and minutes and minutes. So instead of designing your meeting of, okay, I'm going to run you through our eight priorities, why don't you get people and ask them questions and get them contributing or maybe break them into smaller breakout groups of twos and threes and fours and, and have them discuss because we want to actively engage people. And when we do that, surprise, surprise, their energy goes up. But this is all about being smart as leaders, all these things. So that's just a couple of examples of strategic things and tactical things that you can do to create a more collaborative environment. 
And by the way, this book is just jam packed with tactical ideas like that in each of the sections. I mean, we only scratched the surface on this book. And honestly, I probably could have interviewed for a couple hours because there's so much to cover. But I think the call to action, I'm going to tell people, go get this book. It's fantastic. It's really well written. It's practical. I think just in talking with you, you sort of write like you talk. And I mean, the nicest way possible. I think it's simple. It's easy to understand. It's a good, I want to say manual, but that's not the probably the correct terminology for this. It's the how to be a great leader. It's a great, well written book. And I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. What's the kind of the parting thought that you want to leave people as we wrap up? Sure. Well, first of all, yeah, if people want to learn more about the book, you know, they can actually go to The book has its own website, which is www.crackingtheleadershipcode.com. So it's spelled the way it sounds, unlike my name. And they can actually preview, they can download chapter one right from that page right there. So you can get a taste of the book, even greater depth. But I would say is that the first step to developing your own leadership is the commitment to be intentional about everything you do. I know that might seem overwhelming, but the fact is, as leaders, we are being watched all the time. And you know that because you do that with your leaders. So start to be more aware of everything that you say, everything you do, and everything you don't say, and everything you don't do, and ask yourself the question is, is that the message that I want to be leaving? Because you are leaving a message, and so you want to get really intentional about what that message actually is. Allah, thanks for coming on. This has been a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Brandon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. 